Good morning, everyone. This is Ron. Uh, Sunday morning, a little after 11 a.m., and we'll go ahead and get started with our, our session. Uh, we will, again, start with questions and see if anyone has any any questions from yesterday or uh, anything else that may have grabbed your attention in the last, uh, in the, since yesterday. Anyone? Questions, comments? I hope that you guys are in a talkative mood. Uh, I have something that I want you to help me with this morning. Uh, I have had two people to call me, uh, two people who have, have never met. Uh, one called me last week and, and uh, to ask me about the book of Ecclesiastes, the the, the uh, third chapter, and uh, I forgot about it. I, I I forgot to look at it. Well, he called me again Friday of this week to ask about that chapter, and uh, then the funny thing was I got a text from someone else who doesn't know him that also asked me about the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. So. Uh, if you guys don't mind, you want to take a look at it this morning? Let's let's take a look at this and see what, uh, and not necessarily just the third chapter. It's, to me, it is one of the most fascinating books in the Bible. And uh, we'll go into that too. And that's, that's just my opinion, of course. But let me know when you're there, okay? Probably one of the, at least for, for my knowledge and my experiences, one of the least talked about books. Uh, it is Solomon, uh, King David's son Solomon, who took the reign after David died, is credited with, with uh, being the, the scribe of these verses. So uh, the reason that uh, I think it's so fascinating is because it asks questions that most of us have asked in our lifetime. What is life? What is this all about? What is purpose? Why are we here? Uh, and uh, that, to me, makes it very interesting. So any any questions or comments, if anybody has studied this before, uh, please uh, please let us know, okay? Anything before we get started? Questions or comments? Okay. What I uh, would Ron? like to do, yes, ma'am. Who is supposed to have written this book? Do you know? Solomon. King Solomon. Solomon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. That's Thanks. what I was going to go. Yes, ma'am. That's what I was going to go into a little bit. I'm going to go back to uh, go back a little ways. And and look at uh, First Kings, uh, First Kings, and First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicle, kind of talks about David and Solomon's life. Uh, David was the king that took the throne uh, after uh, King Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, and uh, Saul kind of got away. From from who he who God was and started doing his own thing and and, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing it y'all just to, for sake of time I guess uh and God anointed David king well David uh was was king and and as the bible uh, description of David is David was a man after God's own heart uh David however got himself in in trouble on several occasions uh he was a womanizer. Uh, he had uh, Uriah killed because uh, he got Uriah's wife pregnant, which was Bathsheba. He saw her bathing, 
and he wanted her and he sent his servants to get her and uh when when he laid with her she became pregnant she sent word to him so uriah was one of his uh people in his army uh, fighting a battle he sent for uriah and for uriah his, his 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 purpose was for uriah to sleep with his wife so that uriah would think that he was the father of the baby but uriah felt guilty because all of the other men were fighting so he went to his home but he did not even enter his home he didn't want to see his wife because he i guess he knew uh you know being with her uh, uh, uh you know sleep with her so that didn't work uh david sent uh, word to have him uh strategically placed in the battle so that he could be killed and uh so he was killed and god punished david for it by the baby that bathsheba had the first baby uh died uh that was part of david's punishment and 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 as a result, uh, David repents of it, and Bathsheba becomes uh, his wife. Well, Bathsheba, Bathsheba has another son, and and of course David has other wives, and he has other sons. But uh, Solomon is the one that he had with Bathsheba, and he is the one that is uh, anointed king, or uh, chosen it to be king. So that's where we are here. Uh, so, I- any questions about that? Because I'm I'm skipping a lot of stuff. It's, it's a lot that that went into that. Oh. Uh, okay, but let me let me just read a couple things because I want to tell you about. Uh, I want to set this up so you can get a clearer picture of Solomon. Uh, and see who who he was, and, and you guys can can stay in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and I'll tell you what verses I'm reading because I want you to see who Uriah is. Okay, I'm in First Kings chapter three, verses six through nine. I'm going to read this uh, to you. First Kings chapter three, verses sixteen. Then Solomon says. Now David has died, and 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 uh, Solomon is is uh, being uh, crowned as, as as king of of Israel. So it said, then Solomon said, Thou hast shown great love and kindness to thy servant David, my father. He's talking to God. He's in prayer here. He's it's in a dream, but he's talking to God. Thou hast shown great uh, loving kindness to thy servant, David, my father, according as as he walked before thee in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward thee. And thou hast reserved for him this great loving kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as in this day. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy son servant king in the place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And thou servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. So give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people to discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of thine. So what he, what he, what he, he re- yes, ma'am. Where were you reading from just now? I'm reading from, I, 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 I'm going to, we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes, but I'm reading from first Kings chapter three, because I want you, I'm trying to do a background so okay. that you can see who so- Solomon is. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If everybody with me. I, I don't want to confuse you. I just didn't want to start in Ecclesiastes and you 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 not know how he got to be king or his relationship with God. He's following in the footsteps of his father. Uh, and and hopefully, when you when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, you you'll see what I'm what I'm getting at. So if if I go on just a little further in this, excuse me. 
in First Kings chapter 3, it says, and it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have you asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there be no one like you before, nor shall there be like uh, no one like you arise after you. So, and, and it goes on to talk about how God blesses Solomon and 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 uh, what He gives him, uh, and all the riches. He's Solomon is credited with being the richest man in in at least in his time in the earth. Uh, he was the richest. He was uh, the, the, by far the wisest. And it talks about people coming from all over the world uh, to test his wisdom. And uh, it, it and that even is how he ends up uh, meeting and and uh, having a son with Bathsheba. I, I mean, with uh, uh, the queen of. Uh, Queen Sheba. Excuse me, let me, let me find this. So uh, there was something else I wanted to read to you that I thought was extremely important. I told you about he's the richest and the wisest king. Uh, Now, verse chapter eleven of First Kings said, "Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, according along with the daughters of Pharaoh, the Moabites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Sodom, the, 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 the Sidonians, the Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the sons of Israel, you should not associate with them, neither shall they be associated with you, for they will surely turn your heart away from you." away from their God. And Solomon held fast in these for, to, to love for help for Solomon held fast to these in love. And here's the one I wanted you to get though. And he had this is King Solomon. He had seven hundred wives and princes and three hundred concubines and his wives turned his heart away. So that's uh the, the, the wealthiest man in the world, he has all this stuff. Uh, he has all these women, and uh, this turns out to be uh, his his downfall, okay? But this is a book. Ecclesiastic is a book that he wrote uh, approaching his old age, and it almost sounds like an awakening uh, when, when you read this. So any questions so far? Does that kind of uh, shows you who Solomon is? Does that help any? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to see where to start here. He said, I'm starting in, in chapter 2, verse 1 of chapter 2. And I said to myself, come now and I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself and behold, it too was true and brutal. I said to laughter, it is madness and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explore with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was, was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under the heavens for the few years of their lives. I enlarged my work. I built myself, I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. 
I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of, of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and I had homeborn slaves and I possessed flocks and herds and, and larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. And I collected for myself silver and gold and treasures of the kings and provinces and provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men and many concubines. Then I became great, increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. And all that my eyes desire, I did not refuse them. That's, that's, that's important. And all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart uh, from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of my labor. And this was my reward for all my labor. Thus, I considered all my activities which my hands had done and labor which I had exerted. The whole all was vanity and striving, and afterwards there was no profit under the sun. What do you see in that? What 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 do you make of that? There is a there there, there is a saying that we are all familiar with. Uh, the saying is pe people think the grass is always green on the other side. Uh, I, I said to you at, at the onset that uh, I could see myself, especially in the early parts of not only did I, the, the pleasure part of the thing that, that I thought brought, would bring me pleasure, uh, but the the seeing other things that you know uh, the, the 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 cars the job the the status all those things so Solomon represents that part of man that uh, uh that is extremely earthy that sees things and wants it for his pleasure uh the conclusion he reaches though is. Is, is, is wisdom and keep in mind this is talking about a life journey though it is not something that he came to immediately and that's why I, I wanted to point out all the silver and gold and all the people that that bowed before him at one place it said there were more people than the sands on the seashore so he had uh, rain possibly over you know most of the earth not not physically but in status and power um th that's how much respect he had and the reason why i said that is he uh his father had fought many wars and because of that god would not let david build a temple because of all the the the, the battles that he had been in all the wars he had fought so solomon is credited with building the temple for God because Solomon is the only king that I recall in Jerusalem that did not fight a war. He lived in peace his, his whole existence. So here is a man that is surrounded by pleasure. He has everything that he set his eyes on. He has everything that he could even dream of having, including wisdom and understanding. And he calls it Vanity. So, what, what do you, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Nobody has anybody ever read this before? Read, read these verses. Good morning, Ron. Um, this is Mary. So when I when I read this, uh, I, I enjoy the story of uh, uh, Solomon and the stories in the Old Testament. But I look at it and I see Solomon as, you know, like you said, he's out there looking for um, physical pleasure. Nothing spiritual is not inward. Everything is outward. I'm sorry. What was your question? Because I done went somewhere else. What was your question? Because no, no. I didn't answer Keep going. That. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Keep uh, going. 
Oh, okay. Know what you see in and what yeah. the and and that's the thing too. You can have all these things that, as Solomon attests, and as we sometimes can attest, having all these outward things, but it's inward that makes the difference. And that's why Solomon said, in my opinion, that all this stuff is vanity. Mm-hmm. It's just vain. I mean, there's nothing to it. It goes away. It it's just temporary. So, and that's how I saw Solomon when he tells that even. You know, all through the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, oh, it's vanity. If you don't have that inwardness, if you don't know who you are and go inward, nothing else will matter to you. Because it was like you get bored. I got a new car. I was so excited. And the newness w- went away quickly. It may have stayed a week, but I doubt it. So it was just vanity. I wanted a new car. I got it. And then after a while, what's the big deal? And that's how Solomon saw Everything that he had with all these women, and they did draw his heart away from God. And then he come to realize, okay, this is not who I am. That's it. That's all I want to say. I hope that helps. Thanks. Yes, ma'am, it did. And and the funny thing, Mary, this guy had over a thousand women living in his palaces. Uh, it talks about seven hundred wives and over three hundred concubines. Uh, he has all these women, and yet he could not find balance. He could not find his balance. They were all they were pulling him in in so many different directions. Uh, he he lost track of who he was. The funny thing though that that he says in in here uh, that I read uh, for you was he kept saying I I I I did this I did that and I made these for myself and I did this for myself. Look at how many times he says for myself. So his 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 greed, his selfishness, uh, and, and all that wisdom, and and everything it it, it says in here uh, in one verse, and I don't know if that was included in the one that I read for you. God said to him, "Ask me whatever you please, whatever would please you, ask me for it." So he he asked God for wisdom, and and to discerning how to judge the people, but he doesn't share who he is. He does not share the godliness that he has. Because if you notice in here, it calls him the preacher. It calls him the preacher. So at, at some point, he uh, his relationship with the, with the uh, uh, creator increased, and, and, uh, but the outward things kind of kept him at bay. So there's there's a lot in here, but as I said, what what Pastor said is something extremely important yesterday. He he said uh, we we can dissect these verses, but we have to see how to apply them where we are today. And and this one certainly does, as as Mary said, at some point of this, some piece of this, all of us can see ourselves, or or some place we have been at, at some point of our lives. Right. Yes, ma'am. Hey, this is Barbara. Um, I, I was going to uh, uh, point out just what you did, the I and myself, for me. Yeah. I did this for me. I did this for myself. Uh, and the, the second thing I wanted to point out was everything I desired, all the pleasures I desired, I got. And, and it reminded me of the lust of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of those things that Mary was just talking about, which is just, you know, uh, vain, carnal stuff. Uh, and even though he was, quote unquote, the richest man at that time, and he had everything that he desired, there was something that was still missing. There was still a vacuum in his life. Yeah. And, it, and, and as Mary pointed, out, Mary pointed out, it was that spiritual aspect that was still needed and required. You're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And, but 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 can you see us in this? Especially as as uh, Africans, we have at some point in our life. I think uh, we we we're growing out of it. At least what I'm saying is that the, the people on on the phones here who are are uh, seeing a mirror seeing who we have held ourselves up to be, seeing what our desires are. And that is the part of what we have been talking about for 
last few years now, uh, the the bringing that ego under submission, bringing that that part that sees through the eyes, uh, uh, bringing it under submission, and and uh, seeing what is true, what is real. So as we discussed yesterday, uh, the holiness part of it is there comes a sacrifice. There comes a part of you where your eyes are open and you see who you truly are. And uh, the, the sacrifice is letting all this stuff go, letting that ego go, letting those voices uh, go that, that says, mm, that looks good. Oh my gosh, she looks good. Let me have this. Let me have that. Let me partake of this. So this is sounds like uh, an awakening for for mankind to me. And I, I, I see everybody at some point in their lives in this. Anyone else? Hey, Ron. Oh, yes. I hear what everybody was saying, and I got out of well, what he was saying. He, he was making himself like arrogant. Oh, well, when you say I, what I did, what I, um, what I obtained, I mean, he was arrogant in all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, and you, you, you I, I'm trying to remember, because I, I didn't, I, I tried to research this to, to give you some background on it, but I don't remember in the end uh, how, how he dies. I, I, I did not get that far, but uh, his in, in chapter 12, he kind of comes to his senses a little bit, and, and uh, we'll point that out today before we leave. But uh, I'm going to read part of, if you will, guys, help me uh, kind of dissect this. Uh, one thing, too, uh, this, this book is to me kind of stands a little different than most books in the Bible, whereas uh, he writes this purely by himself. There, may, uh, uh, pretty much by himself. You know, you don't see uh, anyone, any dialogue uh, in here. Uh, at least I didn't run across it anyway, because I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, this, these are, are, are things that are running in his head, and that, to me, kind of makes it a bit interesting. Uh, but I'm going to pick up in, in chapter 3, verse 14, and, and I, I, I may go all the way. I want to read 21, 22, and 23, but I want to read something else before. Verse 14, I'm going to start, and it says, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take away from it, for God has so worked that man should fear him. That which is has already been, and that which has already that which has already been, for God seeks what has passed. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice, there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and for every deed, for every day is there. And I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God will surely test them. God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are not are but beasts. I like this part. This this is where it gets interesting. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast. For all is vanity. All go to the same place, all came from the dust, and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends up or the breath of the beast descends down to the earth? And I have seen that nothing is better than, than that man should be happy in his activity, for that is his lot. But who is to bring him in to see what will occur after him? What do you think about that? 
you you agree with his assessment of, of things or what do you think of those verses? Hey, this is Barbara. Basically, what it reminds me of is that um, uh, we talked about our animalistic behavior. Well, Solomon was talking about, you know, the animals and, and man. And without that spiritual uh, essence and an and awareness of it, an understanding of it, and a knowing of it, um, we, just, we just go through the motions just like animals go through the motions. We breathe in, we breathe out like they breathe in, breathe out. Um, uh, uh, we, animals have no morals. They just do what they do to survive. Um, and a man that is not spiritually underpinned uh, uh, will not have morals and will be greedy and will be selfish and will simply do what he needs to do to to be on top of the next person and to get what he wants. I, I, I couldn't agree more, Barbara, when he talks about the state of the righteous and the wickedness and, and, and watching the right, righteous, uh, I mean, watching the wicked prosper. Uh, I, I like the observation. His His total vision, though, shows no spiritual insight. Uh, even when he himself talks about his own pleasures, uh, it, it, it shows no spiritual insight. Uh, now, he says at, at, the, at the end of those verses, uh, that chapter, uh, who knows where the breath goes, whether it goes up or to, up to down, or the breath of man go up and the, the breath of the beast go down. So uh, he's, he's, he's speaking merely from his flesh, but his I, I guess the thing I've admired about it was that he's pondering, he's he's uh, he's examining who he is, he's examining his life. This whole thing kind of uh, reads of his life and his observations and the things he's experienced, and that journey uh, to me kind of sums up a, a lot of mankind. Even today, we see this. So my my the things that I see and, and say about him is not so much judgmental as it is an observation because it does speak of the journey of man. Yeah, anyone else? You you see something else or something different? Hey, Ron. This is Rainier. Hey, Rainier. Um, so as I listen to this, just in broad strokes, you know, we talked about initially how David was not, uh, you know, I forgot what, uh, what was said about him, but, you know, he he, he, he had, I, I forgot the word you used, but, you know, he had slept with Bathsheba, um, um, even though, you know, that wasn't proper. Um, yeah. I look at, I, I look at Solomon. And this idea of ownership of, of 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 women in it strikes me, and I guess I was wondering as I listen to that, when we talk about you know children being your thought, what are spouses and is a woman's spouse a wife the same as a male spouse? In that when you look at that spiritual level of what that means, because I know the number of women is important. But the fact that they were women versus me as a woman listening to this, thinking, what, what if I were to put myself in Solomon's shoes? Because it's hard to. When, uh, all I see is someone who, you know, slept around a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it was yeah. okay. Whereas for me at that time, it would not have been. So I, I, I have a disconnect there. And I guess I wanted to understand that more. And then the other, um, you just made the comment about what, what animals do versus what man does. And we talk about that, you know, comparison, and yet animals don't 
destroy the world world the way humans do. You know, when we there's balance in in nature that we have in essence we we uh, work to to undermine. And so animals, just being animals, are able to have a balanced existence, whereas we, being an, of animal but now more spiritual, have this very disruptive uh, impact. So those were just two things I really have more questions about than anything. Um, the, the what the women, uh, a female spouse means versus a male spouse, and then the the idea of balance for the spiritual creature that now is aware of itself in the way animals aren't, but creates more destruction as a result. Mm-hmm. Two, two, two very good observations, Rainier. Uh, and I too pondered the women part of it. And, and it was uh, one of the, the, the places that I wanted to pause on. I did not have a, uh, a, a lot of insight into it, except to say, uh, you you do not sleep with anybody without giving and receiving. Uh, so if if you are connected to the creator and you have slept with women from a thousand different cultures and different backgrounds and different beliefs and serving different gods, that affects you. That affects your thinking. That affects who you are. Uh, uh, and and all of this. Uh, does not bring him balance. If you think about, uh, we, we've talked about this before, the masculine and the femininity, as you pointed out, uh, the, the, the balance and that, that, that brings and, and uh, the, the oneness. Uh, so there is no opportunity here for oneness. There is well, no so, opportunity. So that's kind of not what I'm asking, though. Um, okay. when, when you first read the I had a flashback of childhood and of a church discussion, okay. maybe when I was in Bible study or something, but it wasn't, it was like with adults in the Bible study. And they were talking about this verse and um, they were discussing it. And at one point it, they talked about how it was the women that led Solomon astray. And, and the guys kind of looked at each other and yeah, it was the women, you know, <laughs> And this idea of, again, female energy being what brings the downfall of the man is a big part of what that verse is saying. He had all these women, they even led to his further <laughs> you know, and that's why I get back to the symbol of a, of a, of a female or a, um, a female spouse. Like in Job, we talked about the children being his, his thoughts, but what, what is that impact of male and female? Because to me, this is very anti-female kind of scripture, frankly. Yeah, let, let me get back to it because it says something there that I want to point uh, that I thought was extremely important and I may can, have read it. Can I but, but comment? Please, yes, of course. Um, Rainia, um, all of that is a matter of interpretation, but if you look back at, at verse um 11 uh it says he has made everything beautiful in its time also he has put eternity in man's mind um and verse 14 says i know that whatever god does and do is forever nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it god has made it in order that men should fear before him so He's put eternity in man's mind, meaning meaning he has made us Elohim. We had we, man, whoever, has taken it and twisted it and done and interpreted it in the way that he needed to make himself feel good, <laughs> blame it all on the woman. Um, but, but he's telling us right here, God has put eternity into man's mind. He has told us we are Elohim and that will not change at any point. Um, 
it is man himself who's taken that and corrupted it and interpreted it in a way that puts blame on women or puts blame on whatever or puts blame on anything but himself. Um, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. And I want to add to that. Ah, uh, the, the the men in the church find any reason to, to keep the female down, just like they said, Adam and Eve. So it was all Eve's fault. It's Eve's fault. So one of the things they were warned. Solomon was warned not to deal with certain women. And what did Solomon do? He disobeyed. So because he disobeyed, his heart was led astray. But it has to do with what what our intentions are and the purpose you were told not to do it and you did it anyway and because that your heart was drawn away because he had these women and he wanted to please all go on baby put that one up put that one up sweetheart knowing that um god told him not to so and again Mary. That's, another, that's another way for the church to tell us to shut up but guess what new day praise god oh yeah thanks <laughs> and to add to that mary um he knew exactly what he was doing. So they didn't lead him astray without him being wanting to go. <laughs> if you see what I mean, because he, That's right. he had the total wisdom of the creator. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he, he went because he wanted to go. That's right. They look different. So he was going to try a different fruit. That's all. That's what I so said. Could, could in the story Solomon be a woman who had a lot of husbands and the story go the same way? Or is this the masculine energy? I guess is where I'm getting at too is how do I put myself in the story except as one of his wives as a female feminine energy that, that I'm still struggling with? Can, can I read something first before we go on? I, I want to kind of set it straight because you – here's – I think I agree with what everybody said, but I want to read this part to put it in, because as as you said, God had warned him, and 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 the church does its part to keep women in their place. You are exactly right. So I'm sure this has been women have been beat over the head with this everywhere in America that it has been studied. But listen to this carefully. And now in in First Kings chapter eleven it says. And he had 700 wives and princes and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. It doesn't stop there. Verse 4 says, for it came about when Solomon was old, his wife turned his heart away after other gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord God as his father, as the heart of David, his father had been. So this is Solomon's fault. This is Solomon. Uh, you, you, a, a thousand women, and and as I said, uh, this is you, you become a part of them, and they become a part of you. And just like uh, someone mentioned, uh, 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 what was that boy? Adam, 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 and and, and Eve. Uh, that portion of that. Is is thought why why it mentions Eve? It's it's not a separate woman. This is not a separateness that that Eve were, were, were did something and brought it to him and he didn't want to do it. This is him right there. At this point, he is both female and male, and this is saying that portion of him that uh uh, uh supposed to be spiritual. That portion of him that's supposed to or have this discernment, this is what he desired to do. And that is why uh, it, it, it said it looked good in her sight. It looked good. So it had already played itself out in his mind. So this thing said it happened when he was old. This, is, this thing is something he's been contemplating for years. Every time he's with one of these women, he gets further and further and further away from who the creator is. So this has, it hasn't to do with the women. It has more to do with Solomon. 
but yeah. you're not going to hear it. You're, go, you're not going to hear it uh, or, or talked about that way. Yes, sir. Yeah, I um I see Solomon not as a person, an individual man with all those females in his life. I see Solomon as um, a message. Regardless of how close you are or think you are to the Creator and how faithful you feel that you are to uh, carrying out the desires of the Creator for your life, without regard to how many, um, how much feminine energy you're in the midst of, uh, you, are still, you still have the propensity to uh, manipulate that energy or to take advantage of it. And I, I don't, I see Solomon as being um, an example of, of, of um, a method saying, uh, do not think that you are beyond um, falling into uh, a space uh, that is adverse to uh, what you um, were brought into the earth to do. Uh, Solomon was extremely manipulative when it came to females. And, and that is speaking to the masculine energy and its manipulation of feminine energy and blaming everything on that feminine energy or blaming it on the female until we get an understanding, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, until we embrace the reality that we are never so close uh, to, our, to being who we were created to be until we are beyond our reproach. Uh, we will always have um, the um, what the we will ha- always um, be subject uh, to to our failing in our on our journey uh, to to balance. So I, I don't think we can discuss this as a man with a thousand women. Thank you. I I, I agree with you, Pastor. I I I, I saw that thought, man. I meant to look that up. I, I'm going to tell you what it reminded me of when I thought about this and I, I didn't write it down. I remember uh, going back and looking at both sides of Abraham and the 12 sons and the one daughter uh, and, and, and that representing balance. And, and here he is, uh, this, this being uh, almost the, the the total opposite of that, and and speaking of that as a, as an imbalance of who he becomes, but uh, yeah, I I, I see everything that you said there. But Rainia, does that answer your question? Um, it helps. Um, I I think it's the how to move away from that that idea of a man with a thousand women and the thousand women kind of their impact on them. Um, yeah. Because I, I do get stuck there when I read this one. And like I said, I think it was that early memory and just feeling a lot of shame being a woman who could lead a man astray. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, it, it just, it was an early lesson that said that, you know, women are, are poison or what have you and um, have this adverse impact. On men. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. This is uh, Sheldon. Um, yeah, what what I've been uh, thinking about, Rainy, as you've been, uh, well, as we've been having this discussion, is this is you know clearly as um, been mentioned, this is definitely coming from uh, uh, kind of like a, a blaming and from a very patriarchal standpoint. Um, you know, from the, the man's uh, point of view, which we know most of the uh, the Bible is written kind of like uh, in that way, and at least in the way that we have it today with our current uh, version. But this is just a lot of gaslighting. This is no different than me over uh, indulging in eating and then blaming the food for it, the food for it being so tasty or looking so good and tempting me and not taking the responsibility of myself and in, in just uh, overindulging. So how this relates to uh, everyone, in a sense, is kind of, we talk about balance, over and indulging, in a sense, to, uh, in a thing, to the point where it completely takes over us, and it is the more so the author of our uh, life. It is uh, running our life or dictating uh, everything that goes uh, on, so to speak. 
and we have, uh, in a sense, fallen off uh, center with who and what we are, and it's not us controlling our life and our experience and being uh, grounded and being the one with the Father and who we are, et cetera. It's just more so that we're being uh, led by this overindulgence of a thing that is completely taken over. Um, it essentially is a, an addiction, if you want to think about it in another sense, and what was happening with these uh, with these women. I'm finished. That helps, Sheldon, because I, as I read this too, I thought he must have been a nymphomaniac to, be, <laughs> to have so many. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just thought about, uh, I mean, I never thought about it until you brought it up, but I was just like, this is essentially the same thing. I'm overeating and I'm just blaming the food. Who can't be uh, blamed for uh, for that? Like, that's, that's ludicrous. The food fault that I keep overeating is <laughs> no different. Yeah, as we, we said at the onset, uh, I, I see this as a journey of the mind uh, that we and and of course it is reaching extremes here we we don't always reach these extremes but uh we don't uh we don't have to to get the point across as as Sheldon is is, is alluding to uh he had the, the, the in this analogy here uh he, the, the resources are there to indulge yourself in, in whatever is pleasing to you. And, and that's part of the main message, the overindulgence. Uh, and and uh, Ron, right quick, I do uh, agree that most likely is a situation where um, uh, Pastor, Pastor Richard mentioned just now, too, in terms of manipulation. So even that plays a role in terms of, okay, he has all of these uh, women, in a sense, he has some type of, of course, power over them, so he can make them do whatever it is that he wants them um, uh, to do or take advantage of his um, position in terms of this being an opportunity for them uh, it, it, as well. So even in that dynamics, as we are connected to everyone, you know, et cetera, that in itself is a whole nother uh, area where I don't want to say it tears down uh, the self, but in a sense, you come become more and more disconnected when you take advantage of or manipulate your, uh, I guess in this sense, we would just say neighbor for your own gain. Like that in itself, very subtly, uh, takes us further away in, in, a, in a sense. So there's a lot going on uh, here. You want to go uh, yeah. further, also, the thing that that does when we do that, that devalues um, the godliness of an, of the other person as well. So it's, it's a lot uh, a lot going on, and I do think going through this and um, all of this throughout his life is what brought him uh, to that understanding that all the stuff he's been doing is you know pretty much just empty uh, because. It, it wasn't fulfilling him uh, in the way that any other uh, person or the vast majority of the people or the general person would have thought, hey, this would have been great. This would have been a life, uh, so to speak, if it, if it came to um, to be empty. That's, that's, that's extremely important uh, to point out that he takes notice of that. There is an internal part of you that recognizes that these things uh, that's you know that I'm pursuing is not uh, fulfilling. There, there, there is something that makes us aware of that. Uh, and and he, as I said, this is written in his old age, but it sounds like he took stock in that. And part of the, his journey in in reaching out to grasp all of these things was him trying to be fulfilled, trying to find fulfillment. Uh, so it, it points out that that part of, of man, that search, that part of his journey, uh, man is aware of, even though I am obtaining things, uh, this is not, this is still not filling that void that I feel inside my soul. 
my mind is being fed, but not my soul. And 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 something something else you said, all uh, that I think is important, and and that status and power, uh, and, and no matter what degree that may be, if, if you are Solomon or if you are just uh, uh, someone who has very little status and power, this can go to your head. This can lead you. Uh, away from who you truly are or uh, if because it becomes something that becomes mindful and not uh, uh, showing you your spiritual side at all so this it, it, you're right it, there, there's a lot in here you know as as y'all were talking about those another thing for my second question kind of came to me when I was asking about balance the animals having balance but humans not and I think it does go back to possession, which is what we started to talk about. You know, Solomon possessed, quote unquote, these wives, these concubines, these slaves. These, um, and I, I was thinking about that with like homelessness here in California. And you'll see somebody, you know, they'll put up a tent. My husband's telling me that he saw somebody put up a tent one day. And then the next day, more trash was next to that tent, more people. And, and I, what always got me about that is I see homeless folks setting up encampments. And what starts to happen is surrounding their encampment is all this trash. And I know part of that is they don't have trash cans, but part of it goes back to possessions, right? You know, even if you see someone in New York with a big shopping cart, it's not enough for me to carry what I need. I've got to carry all those things I think I need for the future. And I do it in my daily life. And I think that's part of what drives man kind to be um, off balance with the world. We we think we have to possess all these things for our comfort, for our future, for our children, for our whatever, fill in the blanks. And the idea of having enough for today is so foreign, <laughs> you know, to, to what we, where we are. And that is definitely how the animals think. Do I have food for today or not? If not, I go out and get food. Do I have a place to sleep tonight? You know, if not, I go, you know, find a place to sleep. Um, it, it, it is it is very hard, I think, for us to break that mold of what we've been taught. Great observation. You're yeah. right. Go ahead. When Solomon talks about <clears throat> um, men like beasts, it, when he said God has chosen them, but only to see that they themselves are as beasts for the fate of men and the fate of beasts. They have one and the same fate. The question becomes, why is that? And if you go back up to the uh, previous verse, you'll find out why I think. Um, and the, Solomon says, I have a observed beneath the sun. In the place of justice, there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, there is wickedness. I mused, God would judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for everything and for every deed there. So what is Solomon saying? Solomon saying in the place where there should be justice is not, is wickedness. And, and in the place where there should be righteousness, there is wickedness instead of righteousness. Therefore, man is no different than the beast. Can you see that? Hello? Can you say that? Yeah, I can see it. So, so what he's saying is because because man is not pursuing justice, even though he's pretending to, he's no different than the beast. And his spirit is, of the, is the same as the spirit of the beast. And that is no different than what we talk about when we talk about the animalistic attitude. We, the, the spirit of the beast and the spirit of the man is no different based upon how man uh, responds to the principles of the creator. And when you say beast, do you mean animals in general, or do you mean the animalistic nature that is not inclined to kindness, empathy, you know, love kind of thing? I mean both. Mm. Um, wild animals are wild because men are wild.
why is it that there are people who are able to coexist with what we call wild animals and they don't bother them, yet there are others who are unable to do that? If we are to dominate or be dominant in the earth, then the dominant attitude in the earth would be reflected in everything else in the earth, the weather, the animals, etc. So when the dominant attitude becomes one of peacefulness, of course Solomon's name means peaceful, when it becomes that uh, that of peacefulness and when justice uh, prevails instead of uh, pretending to be justice, then the um, beast would be different as well because the dominators of the earth attitude would be also different in terms of being pleasant and loving kindness, etc. Question makes sense? It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to read something else and to continue the discussion, y'all, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm going to read portions of, of Chapter 4. And and uh, this this is 12 chapters long. And uh, when I first started reading this, as I told you, someone mentioned to me about Chapter 3, uh, just looking at this the whole thing is almost like you just can't read that portion of it. So while we're here, I want to... There are a couple of things I want to. I want to get to chapter five too, but I don't know if we will uh, today. But let's 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 keep going as much as we can. Then I looked again. I'm in verse one in chapter four. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the other side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living, but better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Okay, what y'all see there? What what you see there? I see <clears throat> I see this as an expression of Solomon's pessimism about the plight of man. That that Solomon uh, sees um the same thing that we see now. And 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 when we talk about um don't get caught up in what your eyes see. Uh, stay focused on what your desires are and that is balance. I see um that at this point Solomon is writing about or Solomon has or has been expressive of the pessimistic attitude of man when all the thing he sees around him is the oppressor and the power that the oppressor has. And there is no one to uh, comfort the oppressed the oppressed, neither the oppressor, which means that the oppressor is in the same place where the oppressed are. The oppressed does not see a way out and the oppressor does not care about um, finding a way out for those who are being oppressed. That's what I see. What, what you just uh, explained uh, is, is a thought I, I've had for years, and, and I, I may have ex, uh, expressed this with you, Pastor. Uh, there is not a, a, a thought that takes place in America that does not consider the African. And it, 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 it's mainly how to keep him oppressed. But what the oppressor doesn't see is how much further would both people be if you, that was not your focus. So if you focus on being the oppressor and, and setting up your laws and, and, your, and governing your land that way, how much more is it holding you back? So we, 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 we see in this that the oppressor is more enslaved than he who is oppressed because his mind and his whole being is is a uh, is is a part of of what he's doing. So he he does not even have time to enjoy 
um, the, the fruit of the labor or the fruit of the other man's labor because his mind is totally on that other man and keeping him down. So he is the one that is uh, being oppressed and, and not recognizing it. Well, you can't keep a man in the ditch unless you stay there to hold him in the ditch. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, um, this, this, sorry, go I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, no, ma'am, go ahead. I think verse four is pretty profound too. Because um, it says that then I saw that all toil and all skill and work comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and the striving after the wind. Um I think that's pretty profound because, because in our society, it seems like that's very, very true. Um, people go after the, whatever they go after in work or in their lives because they're envy, envious of what somebody else has, or they want to be more powerful or more influential or more whatever than, than their neighbor. Yeah. So, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, I I'm also looking because uh, I it, it, it's so much in this that yeah we we're kind of skipping around, but uh, but look at verse six and, and and one hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. That you know we 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 are. Uh, we, we we're always finding room to do more. We're, we're always in action. We're always because that's what we have been taught or shown that that is important. That we're always after something. We're always after something. But what is the something? How do you know when you get it? Um. And what value is it to you? No. So, I'm sorry, Ron. I want to look at what R.G. said. Okay. When you talked about men being a rivalry to their neighbor or men being jealous of their neighbor, what did it say about that? It's futility and vexation of spirit, which means that it is frustrating and it causes uh, anger, uh, internal anger, because he's jealous of what the neighbor has. And then it, then the next, uh, in verse 5, it says, the fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh, which means that the fool destroys himself. And better is one handful of pleasantness than two fistfuls of labor and vexation of the spirit. And, uh, all, all he's saying uh, is, is that it, it, is, it, it is better um, for, for you to find uh, a pleasantness within yourself than for you to seek what someone else has or to be jealous of what they have. We, that this society is built on jealousy. This society is built on uh, wanting more than some, someone else has or something better than someone else has. We don't, we don't talk about it in that way. However, if we think, if we think deeply about the, how, how we move in the society, it is, it is uh, buried in the whole concept of I want my child to be better than I am. It's very deep in that concept, and and if I want my child to be better than I am, then what am I teaching my child? Not only am I teaching my child to be better than I am, but deep, very deeply in that is teaching my child to be better than the next person, which in itself has the propensity to breed uh, jealousy and robbery, and 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 that jealousy and robbery is it, the person who who's engaged in that is deemed to be a fool. And the fool destroys himself because of of, um, of the robbery and and the um, the jealousy that it has towards his neighbor. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, Audrey, does that coincide with what you were talking about? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I don't mean to, uh, we, we don't have to leave chapter four, but I, I want to read something at the first part of chapter five. 
while uh, while while we are here and uh see what your thoughts are on this. Excuse me, brother. Excuse me. Yes, sir. This this is Amir. Can, can I just make a point about something in chapter four that I see before we go to five? Of is that I see I see this voice of a person that's speaking uh, apart from the whole. And then a part where he begins to give us the warning that what he lived is not worth it, but what you can build through collective endeavor, through all of us working together is much better for all of us. Uh, like from, from verse nine to 13, where he says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their hard work. For if one of them falls, the other can help his partner up. But what will happen to the one who falls with no one to help him? Moreover, if two lie down together, they will stay warm. But how can just one keep warm? And someone may overpower one alone, but two together can take a stand against him. And a threefold cord cannot quickly be joined. Better is a poor but wise child than an old but stupid king who no longer has enough sense to heed a warning. And the warning is that you choose what is apart from, or do you choose what is a part of a whole? I'm done now. Okay, thank you. This is full of wisdom. It is, and as I said, uh, these are uh, uh, anyone who has has turned his heart inward uh, to, to to either see the creator or even more so question who he is has had uh, some of these thoughts or, or, or some of these. So it is, it is in anyone else. Uh, one, one more thing to interject though, Ron, please, uh, is that, you know, there, there, there's three different ways of, of, of sight. There's, there's, Hindsight, looking in the past, foresight, looking in the future. But today what we need is insight. And this is what this whole study is about, more mm -hmm. insight. Insight, yeah. I like that. Thank you. Um, I also think that, that what, what's happening here is it, that this whole story is, is giving us uh, um, insight into, as Mira said, insight into um, where we are and where, where we've been and, and where we are to go. Um, it, 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 it talks about, or alludes to anyway, the popularity that Solomon enjoyed. Uh, you can enjoy popularity, but popularity only lasts for a season. It doesn't last long. It always falls into disfavor. And, and, and the reason it does is because if you buy into popularity, then you you have a tendency to to um to stop looking inwardly and start looking outwardly. And what you see when you look outwardly is all the accolades that are being bestowed upon you, and you fail to keep to uh to um take care of the inward uh, thought and to deal with you uh, as you are really created to be. And you began to respond to the external uh, accolades, and you lose sight of who you really are. And when you do that, then it becomes all about who you are and what you own and the power that you have. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I've seen that in ministry a lot. You know, really good men who get caught up in you know, uh, the idea of man he can preach or he, he is very popular and then lose sight of the whole idea of the calling itself and mm -hmm. end up um, end up on the top of the world of popularity and, and being rewarded for it in a monetary way and never being able to get back to uh, where they fell from or get back to the understanding of the calling from the beginning. Thank you. Making sense, y'all? Questions or comments? 
well, I got a comment. I mean, it's what Rev just said. Once that person get like that, what happened to his flock? Don't they get, uh, I'd say, burnt too? You, what happens to the flock is it depends on the uh, leadership. Once you get caught up in yourself, then your flock get caught up in you. And, and I, I remember very clearly when there was a, a church uh, in Gaffney that was called the castle. And and if you call it the castle, then that means the leadership is the king. And if you call the leadership the king, then that means the people in that flock are the subjects. And, and if you become the subjects to the king, then you're simply the servant to the king as opposed to the leadership being your servant. And when you lose sight of that, the whole flock begins to follow the, the futility of that leadership and it ends up in the same place as the leadership because his identity is not tied to who, who they were created to be. The identity is tied to uh, the popularity of that, uh, of that leadership, the popularity of that congregation, the popularity that they are enjoying that's being stored, being stored upon them by those who see them from the outside. Does that make sense, Charles? Yes, it does, man. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? And, and that ends in mutual destruction. I'm going to read this, guys. I want I ask you to, to continue the discussion, okay? Uh, I'm starting at chapter 5. Guard yourself as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of food. Of course you uh, I'm in chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Right. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. with me, Pastor? Uh-huh. Okay. Guard your steps as you go to the house of the, of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. All right, slow down. You're reading too fast. Okay. Do not be hasty in words or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that that is a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the works of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. Rather, rather fear God. Okay, what, what do you see there? What, what's... what's uh, what wisdom do you see there? Well, in that first verse, what I see is that um, uh, that when you talked about uh, hold your tongue and not be rash with your mouth when you uh, in the presence of God have few words it is 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 um don't have excessive um don't talk excessively uh, because um the one who talks excessively betrays himself as being a fool uh, so. Um, be moderate in, in, in what you say and not boastful or not hastily in, in the words that you are. In other okay. words, give thought to what you're saying. Yes. If I may, I think also that it says that, that uh, too many words lead to fertility, but few, but fear the true God. That action in the final analysis speaks much louder than words. Yeah.
for, and and you talked about fulfilling all your promises. Yes. Uh, stay true to your word. Um, don't uh, don't don't utter words just to be uttering them. Don't make promises just to be seen or to or to make someone feel good. Be true to what you say uh, you believe. Hold fast uh, to what you know the truth to be. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I thought uh, I, I agree with what you guys are saying. I thought uh, I, I thought I, I could really see the, the, the church in this. Uh, just listen to ministers and 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 people saying uh, amen and and not recognizing what they follow or what they're uh, submitting to and uh, following things that they have not listened to. Uh, and and I really thought that when he talks about the uh, be few in words. Uh, he he was referring to a, a prayer. We do more speaking than meditating, and uh, that's what though what we have been taught prayer is. And uh, so he he's calling that just just foolishness. And he, there there's no way you can hear if you're constantly talking. So that just kind of all. Uh, kind of summed up to me where the church is today. And I saw that. Ron, I have a question. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm looking at the fourth verse um, when it talks about paying the vow to God. And I know that we went through a period, especially in charismatic settings, where there was an actual paying of vows, making a promise, uh, asking God for something and paying the vow paying monetary, just paying money to say, I want this thing to happen. And knowing where we are now, how do you interpret that scripture now, understanding that the growth that we are, are now experiencing, how do we see that verse now? Uh, I, I'll, I'll ask for some help with this, but I, yeah, I remember Kathy when that was very popular in the church, uh, the, the, the taking of vows, and and it always had to do with money. I, I don't remember a time when that did not have to do with money. I don't remember anyone vowing to learn what it means to love more, to learn what forgiveness is. To, to 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 learn to to uh, uh you know to to to, bow, to to study more and to to uh those sort of things it always had to do with monetary uh concerns so uh, uh, again uh that i think is still something that is done in the church uh and i i don't know if that is the uh approach or the place that he's speaking at this from uh, the, the making of promises and not being able to fulfill them. But to me, that this can mean anything. And as I said, uh, I think it, it even includes you agreeing to something someone says and, and, and you're saying amen or you're shaking your head or you're agreeing to it, not understanding fully what you've committed yourself to. So uh, this is a... And and it, let me add to that by saying, uh, I think the extreme importance of this is a one of them anyway is the fact that we are studying this. As as you hear me say a lot, I think we represent the tenth, we represent the whole, and a lot of what this is covering, we are hopefully bringing enlightenment to by discussing it so whatever uh it, it may have been in the past and 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 whatever downfall has brought to man uh we are bringing correction to it now and even uh bringing 
from forgiveness for what man has done uh, to himself and to the church, through the church. I, 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 I think that is one of the reasons why we're studying this. And I don't think I answered your question. I hope I came close, but someone help me out if, if, uh, if you have an answer. The devout, devout came, as you said, from Chris Magic said, and it was to pay money uh, in order. You, you promised God that you're going to pay X number of dollars. In other words, you're trying to buy something. And when, when in essence, it's not, it has nothing uh, to do with that. Um, the vow speaks more, and, and, and what Solomon is talking about, is speaking more to the promises that you make, that we make, that we are cons- we're going to be consistent uh, on the journey of truth. And it does not take the multiplying of words, as Jesus said, in order to get your, your message. Uh, you, don't, you don't act as a hypocrite. And think that because the number of words that you say and the, the greater your, your promise is, that God is going to hear you above everybody else. Um, right now, uh, I can see what you're saying, Ron. Um, I, I see a difference between the promises that we make as well and, and the um, and, and, and the amen thing. I see the promises that are made that Kathy is asking about uh, as being totally off base when it comes to money but, but uh, totally in the ballpark uh, when it comes to being cautious uh, about the words that we utter because the words that we utter has the power to lead others astray, not only to lead others astray, but also to blind ourselves to who we really are. Now, as far as the amens are concerned, uh, I see the idea of saying amen in church is already blind. Uh, people are blinded because what they don't understand what they're saying amen to. And if we look at amen from the from the scriptures, amen is not uttered until the end uh, of what's being said, which means that I hear everything you say and I agree with it. But to say amen to every other sentence or amen simply because somebody tells you to, that, that is an abomination within itself. I hope that helps answer your question, Kathy. If not, raise the question, please. Thank you. I do this see what Barbara. you're saying, but I was also asking um, as far as when it says it is better to not vow than to vow and not pay, and that's where the charismatic got you into coming up, making a vow, and leaving money. But based on what we're saying today, because I really want us to have clarity on this, what we're really saying is the promises that I make, the payment is my commitment to fulfilling that promise not a monetary value that I can put on anything that I've said that I've committed myself to being the, to being I am. I've committed myself to doing the work of I am. There is no monetary monetary thing that I can do or put on the altar, so to speak, because they would have you run down and bow and throw the money on the altar. That is not what this is saying at all. It is saying it is better for you to hold fast to the promises and fulfill the promises from the inside out, as opposed to worrying about paying with money to try to say this is going to keep me. I mean, what what? How does the money? How do we ever think that the money was going to keep me true to my word? And so, I, I as I was thinking about all of this and listening to what was being said, your words being more committed from the inside out, all of this ties together. But I just wanted to make certain that we did not miss how. In the past, how really, when you think about it, ludicrous it is to have thought that running to the front, throwing money at the altar, and making this promise and saying, now I'm going to fulfill it. There is nothing material-wise, that, um, in, in any material way, that is going to help me hold fast and true to the promises that I'm making. This is the promise between me and, and, and who I am and the I am that I am that says I'm going to follow through and see this thing all the way through. And, and experience what what, what um, S called last time, not going back to the beginning, but going to a place of growth. That growth comes as a result of my commitment. And, and it's not about any monetary value that we place on the words that we speak. And I just wanted to make certain that we were seeing this the right way. Thank you. Uh, 
um, this is Barbara. If I can add to what Kathy said, um, I, I thought about as Kathy asked the question, Micah six eight, which talks about um, you know what what is what is required of us to love God um, and mercy and to walk um and to walk humbly, love justice, uh, love God and walk humbly. I'm sorry, I got it. Anyway, Micah says something about being humble, loving each other, and being merciful toward each other. And 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 and, and I, I agree with you, Kathy. How much money is enough money? There's not enough. But if we, if, when you said inside out, the inside out to me is the loving of the of who we are and loving the Creator, and therefore loving the other because the other is me and to, and, and to making uh, decisions in uh, and showing mercy uh, and, and being um, righteous in the way we, we live. In other words, we live what it is we say. And, and, and so our words don't have to have to be something we verbalize. It can be how we live. And if it's in accordance with the creator, um, that's all I owe. That's all I. That's that's all I. That's all. That's what's required of me. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, I agree, one hundred percent. Thank you, Barbara. Well, when you know, when you get to verse um, what nine, it talks about the, <clears throat> those who love money is no, are never satisfied. So um, that, that in itself would speak um, contrary to uh, what the vow is supposed to represent. I'm done. Yeah, uh, my my Bible is, is verse 10, but it says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, now who, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Oh, uh, this has been good, y'all, and, and and we've said a lot. We're gonna put a hold on it right here. But I want to I want to read something to you, uh, for the end of the day. And I'm gonna read this simply because. I don't know who tunes in on Mondays. If we, we, if we finish this or, or, or continue it on Monday even, you never know from one day to the next where we're going. But uh, I want to read something for you. In that, uh, again, this, this uh, book in, is included in his, uh, you know, his walk in life. This is talking about Solomon's life here. And, and his observations and what he's learned. And, and verse 13 in chapter 12 says, uh, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. But God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So that is his conclusion. And again, I said, this is written in his old age. This is talking about his journey. And it actually does show his wisdom because even though he talks about it, he explains to you that, yeah, I am not only I included folly, I intentionally did things that I knew that was nothing but pleasurable to me. But in all of it, uh, he was looking to see if it brought him anything valuable, not just pleasurable, but something of value to it. And 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 that is those things that he's saying. You know what? This too was emptiness. This too had no no value to it. So I just wanted to read that in case, because uh, you, you know, from one day to the next, you don't always have the same audience. So. Uh, if you guys have time to, to conclude reading this, if not, I just wanted to, to, you to know what he concludes at the end of this journey that he's talking about. Okay. Any any questions or, or comments on any of this? This has been a very good discussion. I, I, I've enjoyed this. 
And uh, we'll see where we are tomorrow at 6 p.m. Okay. If there are no more questions or comments, guys, just have a great day. And uh, hope you have a, a, a good good Monday and look forward to hearing from you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you at five.